Welcome everyone to our new small lecture on the many terms used in the world of Utawarero Mono. My name is Galor, Chronicler of Lore, and I'm here to share some of the more readily available information about this magnificent world. In this lecture we're going to talk about the information that is mostly known by the common people of the world. We are not going to be heading into spoiler territory, these are things that the characters you meet in the story already know, so it could be useful for someone even just starting this series. So with that, let's get into some reasons of why. You see, there are a lot of terms used in the world of Uteworomono that are not commonly used outside of it. This is mostly because these terms are unique to this world. If you wonder how come no one uses Oro or Pidiera outside of the setting, that is why. Depending on the particular translations you used to read or watch this saga, you may or may not find the usage of these terms. Some sources will favor using the words of King or Archer over Oro and Pidiera. But in case you stumble into these strange terms, begin to wonder what they are, if context is insufficient, I want to help you to get over this topic. Now. Let's begin, shall we? Now let's begin with the first and probably most important term, the Oro. The Oros are essentially kings or lords of a region. In our main glossary, they are the rulers that govern a land. And their range of power varies from just the ruler of some nation, they can even be some kind of emperor, like the Mikado. And speaking of which, the Oro of Yamato have earned the trust of the Mikam himself. The members of the most powerful family in a given region are often appointed as the Oro. However, there are some that receive the titles directly from the Mikam himself. And as I was saying, as one charged with the governance of an entire land, even the Mikado himself can be referred to as an Oro of sorts. In other countries, the power with the most power of the land is often also called an Oro as well. And there are also some different terms that can be used across different lands. In Onkami Yamukai, for example, instead of an Oro, they have an Oruyankuru, who is the highest rank among those in the country. And it is equivalent, as we say, to the Oro. But the Oruyankuru also have a strong mediating force among different countries in Tuskur and also act as religious leaders. And onto our next couple of terms, Kotoahumaru and the Nebokshiri. They are true opposites. Kotoahumaru is the heaven-like destination where one soul is said to find eternal life. It is a place reserved for the souls who have done good in the world. Interpretations may vary, but some Mononofu see it as a place of eternal feasting and celebration. Kotoahumaru is also said to be the realm where the great Onkame Witson Lamentia is imprisoned by the Onkame Yaryu. The Nemokchiri, on the other hand, is a place where people who have committed sins and crimes go after their deaths. They are subject to eternal torture by the demons that dwell within it. The, the word is also used as mild profanity, like, oh hell, you say, oh, the Nemokchiri. And onto a related note of religion, the priestesses. These are known as the Kamunagi who refer to warming, who just do divine work. They use special powers to perform certain rites, incantations, prayers, and are revered by the people. In Yamato in particular, there are also the Kamunagi of Chains, who bear the specific duty of reining the Akutruka into discipline and keeping their powers in check so that they never use their powers against Yamato. So, what are the Akuruturka? The Akuruturka are wielders of the Akuruka. These are masks given by the Mikado of Yamato to warriors of great prestige. There are multiple masks, and each one with a distinct set of powers. Only the four Ar Ar Kurturka can bring out those powers, though it is said that the mask will eventually fuse together with the wearer and steal their soul. The Kurturka are said to be able to unleash great supernatural powers with these masks. Speaking of the supernatural, let's talk of gods and demons of Onkami and the Wisomkami. The Onkami are essentially good spirits or gods that exist in the world. At least some of the Onkami Yaryu, such as Hultori, can see these Onkami wander about in the land. 
although their exact influence of what happens around them, be it good or bad, lacks any strong evidence to provide a definitive answer. There is, however, the fact that there are onkami who live within each and every person in the world and gives them elemental affinities. I have touched more about this subject about my, my lecture on the people some time ago. Opposite to the onkami, there are the Noi Samkami. They are evil spirits that bring about disaster. These mythical fiends range from minor tricksters to harbingers of godlike power. It is said that the children who do bad things are taken by the Noi Samkami at night and are trapped in a dark world forever. However, the evidence we get to see is that the true Noi Samkami are mostly harmless. Those spoken about in stories and exaggeration are little more than insults, embellishments, or mere boogeymen to scare children into discipline. I should recall, however, that the Nui Samkami are real. Some Onkamiyaru can, in fact, see, interact, and play with them. Again, these spirits can mostly be benign, but make no mistake, they are still demons. And among these demons, there is also Witsolimentia, the murder of the great creator Ombi Taikaya. Again, the power range of the Nui Samkami is rather wide. Next, we have another kind of legend, a more benign one, the Yana Mauna. There speaks of a legend of a pe person who could understand the feelings of various animals, including beasts and birds. He was said to even be able to directly communicate with them. The term, however, is now usually used, used to describe someone who has a natural, if mundanely achieved, talent for handling animals. Aruru, whom we come to know in Proto to the Fallen, is known for being a powerful Yana Mauna, and Lutie is also said to have the same potential. So, what is the matter with Witsonemetia and Ombi Taikayan? Witsonemetia is a god of duality. He is both an Onkami and an Uisomkami. This two-faced god sponsors religion of the same name. His influence permeates all aspects of the worshippers' daily lives. All rituals, from birth to death, are performed in the name of Witsal Nemetia. This god is also called the Liberator, for his great deed of rebelling against his father, Bitaikayan, and killing him, Inon Kamiyamukai. And now touching into our other deity, Onbitaikayan. There is a delicate topic of distinction we must mention. In both of the mythos we come to know, Onbitaikayan is the great creator of the people. In Tusker, however, this is also an oppressing and cruel deity. This so-called Great Father was only worshipped in the region by the Shekukuporu tribe as their great and primordial god, their Onkami. In Yamato, however, legend tells of a race of benevolent, higher beings who created the people of this world and ruled over all a long time ago. Presumably, these higher beings were also murdered by Witsondamentia in Yamato's mythos, considering the attitude of two certain Kamunagi regarding this latter deity. It is important we remember the distinction of how the Ambitakayan and Witsondamentia are, are regarded in Tuskur and in Yamato. In Tuskur, again, Ambitakayan was an evil god who oppressed the people, and Witsondamentia was the liberator. In Yamato, Ombitaikayan were the higher beings who created the people, but wound up being murdered by the Media. They are regarded very differently. And the truth of the matter is more complicated, but I strongly, and very strongly, encourage you to discover this by yourself. Now onto the terms of the military, because regardless of the size of a country, military conflict is a ever-present threat, and there are many different types of troops that they are deployed in each nation. Militaries with large enough numbers are divided into several different units, with each of them having their own tasks and specializations. Among them, some examples include the Kerunerai, Akusharai, Perierai, Tirigerai, Ekumurai, Hitorai, and Yususorai. Some other terms include the Nakwan and the Mononofu, 
the Nakwan refers to a certain practice in war that is abhorred by most modern civilized countries. Some armies rule the conquest of their enemy lands, kidnap civilians, and hold them, their loved ones, as ransom, forcing the able bodied to fight for their conquerors as Nakwan, or expendable slave soldiers. In general, that term is more applicable as just a slave or more especially a slave soldier. Meanwhile, the Mononofu are warriors of discipline and honor, usually guided by loyalty rather than a contract. Their code as a warrior is part of their very identity, and they treat every other Mononofu, even enemies, with certain respect, both in peace and in battle. Now onto the more important military unit types. Firstly, Karunerai. The Karunerai are general infantry soldiers that use katanas and spears as their main weapons. Compared to mounted soldiers, they are not as mobile, but they excel in battlefields such as mountainous areas with virtuous footing or areas where archery is not as effective. Many veteran Karunerai units are able to adapt to any battle situation, and their strength is directly related to the, their individual training and their commander's leadership. Next, we have the Peri Edai. They are just archers. They excel in long distance attacks but suffer in close quarters, therefore, their main task is to support the advance of ground units. With a large number of soldiers, they can rain arrows down on the battlefield to bring a fight to a swift close. However, it takes intensive training to become a military archer, so, there are only a handful of nations that can deploy sizable Peri Edai forces. Now, Dada Kusharai are mounted troops that ride Wopters to deploy high-speed tactics. Thanks to their mobility and charging power, they are quite powerful on flat open terrain. Well, however, they can't work as effectively in forests or other hilly regions. Normally, they are deployed to the battlefield along with infantry divisions to cover each other's shortcomings and optimize their military effectiveness. Now, the Shitourai, their funny name aside, are for the military, troops that are often charged with the task of supplying rations and operating the medical facilities of the wounded, as well as distributing other supplies, performing functions similar to a commissariat unit. These troops are the backline support, and they often have their barest minimum of military power for the sake of self-defense. In drawn out battles, victory may very well hinge on how each side uses a situore and how well the rest of the army can defend them. Next, the Yusu Sorai. In the military, these troops are monk like soldiers who are tasked with backline support. They focus on interfering with the enemy. They use special magecraft to stop their foes in their tracks to help give their allies an advantage. The Yusu Sorai on the Raiko of Yamato are especially experienced, and if not detected, it is said that even the most powerful unit will be scattered like a panic fowl. Related to Taiko are the Tiri Yarai, that are troops employed by this general of Yamato. They do not engage in actual combat, but by using telepathic communications, they can exchange battlefield information in a matter of seconds. They are the linchpin of Raiko's strategies and tactics. Why they do not seem to be used outside of Raiko's command is beyond me, but they most likely should be used outside of his command as well. And now the Kakumurai. They are military music groups. They do not directly participate in battle, but they do organize troops through music. This also serves to raise the morale of the allies and intimidating opposing forces. And with this we now have covered the military unit types. But we also have a few leftover terms to explore. Particularly right now I want to explore a bit into what are the clothing terms. There are two very important terms for clothes that we should remember, the tupai and the periu. The tupai are basically just sash, they are often used to just hold together the clothing you wear, and the aperiu is just some kind of coat. That's basically it. But and one important thing I should mention about clothes is that people have holes in their pants. Yes, they have holes in their pants. That is where their terms come from, after all, they come out from there. Uh, however, many soldiers, especially the males, 
cut them off so that they, they do not become a hindrance in battle. In addition, the hats and helmets that they wear are not just meant for protection and aesthetics, they are also to conceal their ears. Because many races have unique traits, by hiding their ears and cutting their tails, they also hide vital information about their abilities from their opponents. Now onto a final note, the Waptors. The Waptor is the generic term for the mount of the world. They are bipedal creatures, used for transport and are a beast of burden. They are also used in military cavalry. In Tuskud, Waptors are covered in scales, while in Yamato they are covered in feathers. While they look drastically different, they are still the different breeds of the same species. Their main diet includes cereal grain and plants, and they seem quite friendly with the people. But when in the bad mood, they squeak rather loudly. And with that, we have covered most of the important terms of the Utawaramono saga. I hope that this can be of some help to you, if you are enjoying the story of Utawaramono and are wondering what some of the terms mean. And now with that, we have covered all four for this time around, and next time we will be talking about the countries of the world. Again, I'm Galahor Chronicle of Lore, and until next time.